Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming for the last session for today. Um, so we have Aidan Sovi here. He is a cloud native data engineer at KZN, who's on a mission to fight jargon one acronym at a time. Welcome, Aidan. Everyone hear me all right? Cool. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Data Lakes and other bodies of water that killed big data. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation. I'd also like to say a big thank you to all of the sponsors today, as well as the DDD uh, volunteers. They've put a massive effort in and it's made today flow very smoothly, so thank you. Now, today I'm going to take you through the death of big data and then dive into the technology that has pushed it out of the spotlight. Spoiler alert, it's data lakes. Then we're gonna dive into what data lakes actually do and following that, I'll explain a few other water analogies in the data area. So, my name is Aidan, as you've just been told, and I'm a senior developer with KZN. KZN is a cloud consultancy that specializes in serverless technology and data engineering. We have and continue to build data lakes for a range of uh, clients. And let's get started. So, to kick off this story, of how big data went from buzzword number one to a thing of the past, I'm gonna to rewind to the beginning of time, and that was the mid-1980s. In a simpler time, we had data. Data was stored in data warehouses. We used SQL to extract value from that data in the form of reporting, and that was it. Very simple. They like it, so. <laughs> now, as we move forward to roughly 2011, we get into the age of big data. Let's define big data before we move forward. Big data refers to data sets that are too large or complex to deal with using traditional methods, traditional methods largely being data warehouses. Now, what caused the rise of big data? Lots of things, but a major one was social media companies realizing how much money they can make from pushing us personalized ads. Other areas of technology started to pick up, like IoT, if you look at things like cars 20 years ago, they were purely mechanical devices. If you're lucky, they had electric uh, windows. But now we have companies like Tesla or Waymo where your cars are streaming vast volumes of data up. Did I lose my sound? No? Okay. We're streaming vast volumes of data up into the cloud from almost every appliance across the globe. To give some idea of scale, in 2010, roughly 1.2 trillion gigabytes of data was generated by the human race. In 2021, that number was 18 trillion gigabytes. We are on an exponential curve of data growth, and the scale of our data sets is more important now than it ever has been. The problem? There was a few, including structure, which we'll talk about later, but the key point I'm going to focus on here is the pure volume. Traditional methods like data warehouses just could not scale or ingest data fast enough to keep up with the demand, and hence, big data volumes of information too large to be dealt with using traditional methods. So what happened to this huge problem that we saw on every news channel and every magazine cover? To give you an anticlimactic answer, the problem got solved. Data lakes provide a cheap and readily available means of storing and ingesting almost unlimited quantities of data. That's it. Data engineers can sleep at night and everyone lived happily ever after. Except it wasn't quite that simple. Data Lake solved a lot of the problems of big data, but in a classic tech fashion, replaced those problems with newer challenges. But before we dig into that, I'm hoping at this stage you have one very simple question bouncing around inside your head. What is a data lake? And how did it solve these problems? Well, I'm glad you asked, because someone had to. To start understanding data lakes, we're going to need to look at data warehouses that we talked about earlier. Now, data warehouses were the core of business intelligence for the last 30-something years. For those that are new, a data warehouse is a data management system designed to enable business intelligence activities. That basically means we have data and we want to get value out of it. We can break this down a little bit by looking at our key components. We have a data warehouse, which has a database or a variety of databases within it. We have ETLs, that's the extraction, transformation, and loading of data between different sources. And then the system is set up in a way that allows integrations with external services, whether it's an ERP system like SAP or Oracle, or a CRM like Salesforce, through to analytics like Power BI or Tableau. 
Now, the important thing to understand about data warehouses is that they store data in databases. And databases only accept structured data. Hence, a data warehouse can only store structured data. But what is structured data? Now, data can be structured or unstructured. And this is one of the keys to understanding data lakes and the role they play in superseding data warehouses in the race to accommodate vast quantities of data. Let's start by looking at one of the most common types of unstructured data, a CSV. Now, maybe the CSV came from a script reading an API. Maybe it was an export from some third-party system. As you can see, we have data. But we know very little information about this data. What are the data types? Is that an integer or a decimal? Is it signed or unsigned? Is this field allowed to be null, or should it have a default value when it's empty? Is there a primary key, or is there a composite number of columns that should uniquely identify a row? All of these questions are vitally important for us to actually utilize our data, but they cannot be answered without structure. This file, for example, could not be loaded into a data warehouse unless we knew what the structure was. So what does structure look like? I'm going to throw another very common term around that everyone has heard, but a lot of people don't really understand, and that's metadata. Metadata is information about data. In our CSV example, metadata could be an information file that provides answers to our questions. Data types, unique constraints, null handling. Now, there's another common type of metadata involved with data lakes, and that's governance data. When we have hundreds or thousands of source systems feeding into one big data platform, it's very important for us to know where that data came from, who's responsible for it, how often it's refreshed, what the quality is. There's lots of questions. But for the sake of this speech, we're going to focus on the first type, which is the actual structure of our data. We can see you know, this string has a maximum length of 255. We can see that this field is nullable. This is the structure to our data. So what's very important to understand is that when we have unstructured data and the metadata that corresponds to it, we can combine those two things to produce structured data, OK? So to solidify our metadata learnings, metadata is information about data. This information allows us to specifically describe the format and structure of our data. And this allows us to treat the data as structured, which unlocks new ways of analyzing, storing, and classifying the information. Now, this is great, but it feels like I'm off on a tangent. So why do we care about structure? We care because of the definition of a data lake, a centralized store for structured and unstructured data at any scale. The first big difference between a data lake and a data warehouse is that data lakes accept any kind of data, whereas warehouses only accept structure. A good analogy is there's two toddlers in a playground. One of them is the picky kid that only eats foods that are a certain color, and then you have the one in the sandbox eating handfuls of sand. It's not bothering anyone, but he doesn't care. He'll take anything in, and that's what a data lake is. Now, in real life business systems, the majority of our inputs are usually unstructured. Exports from APIs, data dumps from external systems, and manually entered information is normally unstructured. But as businesses want to make data-driven decisions, we need all of this information to be stored in a structured way. This is so we can accurately query it for business intelligence and analysis. And that's what a data lake does. It provides a single body for storing structured and unstructured data, as well as defining automated processes for adding structure to that data. Let's dig into it a little bit more. Everyone loves AWS architecture diagrams, so I threw one in. So. Let's walk through it step by step. First, on the left, we have a range of data sources. Some of these are unstructured, some are structured. Again, that's the key difference between a data warehouse and a data lake. All inputs are accepted. Next, you'll notice there are two zones, an unstructured zone and a structured zone. It's very important we have both of these so that we can accept unstructured or structured data in from outside systems. It's also very important because as we move data through a data lake, Generally, we have a range of zones. And as we move through those zones, our structure, sorry, our data becomes more structured and has a higher quality to it. That's why we've got the structured zone to the right of the unstructured zone. You can see between the two zones, we have a glue job. This is AWS speak for an ETL. 
That's the extract, transform, and load we talked about earlier. Now, this glue job takes unstructured data and it applies metadata to add structure to it and move it into the structured zone. It's worth noting that you can't just throw a random CSV in and expect the metadata to somehow be known. For every source that you ingest from, you need to have the metadata for that data set. Once that data is sitting safe and structured, it can be brought into, into the structured zone. What I have here is a data warehouse and an S3 bucket. But what's important to understand is that a data lake does not prescribe the tooling that we use. Okay? You can have a data lake without a data warehouse, or you can have one with one. What matters is that you have a store for that structured data. You can also see that we have a variety of business integrations like SageMaker that applies artificial intelligence or predictive analysis over the data, Power BI for visualization and coding. Again, these are not prescribed tools. These are commonly used ones, but what really matters in a data lake is that you allow for the integration of external services that provide this kind of value. Now, data lakes also give us the opportunity to tap into a buzzword that executives go crazy for, and that's real time. Gives me shivers just saying it. What is real time? Basically, it means there's a very small turnaround between an event occurring and that data being presented to the end user. That's it. Any modern data lake will provide tooling that allows you to stream high volumes of data in real time, and the AWS solution I'm showing you here is a Kinesis stream. These streams go into a data store, and then we have an external tool like Grafana that reads it at very small time intervals. Again, just one component inside the ecosystem of a data lake. Now, this is why data lakes solve the big data problem for everyday companies. The cost efficiency and scalability of the modern cloud allows us to store enormous volumes of unstructured and structured data without any real specialist input. We don't need big data PhDs to set up Hadoop clusters, and you rarely even need database administrators because all of your instances are running in managed services. That might be controversial. The problem of scaling is gone. So big data sets aren't scary anymore. I'm sure other big scary problems didn't just take their place. Except they did. Common side effects of data lake usage include, but are not limited to, data governance issues, performance, com performance complaints, and massive scope creep. When you have thousands of data sets coming from hundreds of sources being transformed left, right, and center, it gets very messy understanding who's responsible for what data sets and what they get used for, if at all. Next, a 16 petabyte Redshift cluster is going to be slower to query than a 500 megabyte local MS access file. That's the reality, but end users don't care about your excuses. And with scale, comes slow. And now the big one is that now that we have all this amazing and readily accessible data, we need to do more with it than just run reports. Data lakes represent a big step forward in enabling machine learning as well as predictive analysis and automated decision making. Because solving a problem isn't enough, once we can do something, we have to figure out how to get the most value out of it. And suddenly our problem of there's too much data to store becomes a problem of how do we get the most out of all this data that we have. Anyway, this slide is not here for solutions, only pessimism. And now that we understand what a data lake is and how it killed big data, we can move on to the next item, which is other bodies of water. Now it's worth noting while I'm here that this speech to some extent is an opinion piece. There is no uh, standard body that defines exactly what a data lake or a data pond or a data puddle is. They're just kind of terms that people have come up with and every company uses them in a slightly different way. But for some reason, a lot of next generation data infrastructure follows water naming. So let's start with the biggest and the most difficult to understand, the data swamp. Simply put, a data swamp is a bad data lake. Data swamps come around when we have poor data quality or poor data governance. They're bad, don't do them. Any questions? No, good. Okay, next we're moving down the scale. A data puddle is a single purpose data lake used by a specialist team for a very specific reason. It is often used as companies migrate into the cloud and want to dip their toes and test things out for one specific use case before they try to scale up and move their whole business over. You can see this in my extravagant diagram where a collection of happy, synergistic teams make use of a data lake, whereas one sad, lonely, solitary team 
makes use of their sad, lonely data puddle. We don't see these too wildly often, and if I'm honest, I'd never heard of this term before I started researching for this speech. But these are generally used as a proof of concept or by a rogue team that is sick of their company's data architecture. That said, wow, that really resonated. <laughs> All right. Um, that said, they provide an important role in our next body of water, the data pond. This can be described as a collection of small, isolated data systems, and you might have a, a dozen different teams who each have their own data puddle on shared infrastructure. The key difference here between a data pond and a data lake is minimal shared governance or data. The accounting team uses their accounting data that they ingested. The engineering team uses their engineering data that they ingested. But there's not a lot of crossover. It's not one huge big lake of shared data that everyone taps into for their own purposes. This, again, is often seen as a stepping stone to data lakes. But for smaller companies, it may be suitable on its own. So in summary, who killed big data? It was the data lake in the cloud with the scalability. In a more general sense, cloud technology has provided everyday businesses with the ability to scale their data infrastructure much more easily than before. And as a result, the traditional methods that couldn't handle big data have become a thing of the past. We've learned that the data lakes are just big fancy ways of storing any kind of data that you want. And data ponds and data puddles are scaled down, less collaborative versions of data lakes. Are there any questions? Sure. Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot there. <laughs> oh. um, is the unstructured data a key part of, of being a data lake? Absolutely, right. yeah. Um, if you, it's not just the size and scale available in structured, structured data. So the issue with the data warehouse that preceded lakes was that a database needs structure in order to ingest data. So if you want to accept data sources from literally anywhere and not be picky, you need to accept unstructured data because a lot of sources will give us unstructured data. Yeah. I was just going to ask, uh, have you heard of the so-called lake house? And do you have an opinion? <laughs> yes. Um, so Lakehouse is commonly sold through Databricks as one of their products. Um, my understanding of it is it's very good for an organization that wants a data lake but doesn't have a lot of data engineering capability themselves. So it's, uh, you're laughing, you work for Databricks or something? <laughs> um, it's a way of tying in machine learning and artificial intelligence and data governance all into a data lake. It's a bit of an expansion of a data lake and it's a, a bit of a managed product. And what are your thoughts on data mesh? New term to me. Yep, I'll be honest. All right, I'll leave it there. What are your thoughts? <laughs> well, I, think it's, I think it's a way of solving some of the, the problems that are going to come okay. with data lakes and um, data warehouses and rebuilding that monolith of data. Mm -hmm. and, but I, I was just wondering, I won't go into detail, I'm sure, yeah, yeah, your, right. uh, your presentation. I'll look it up after comment. this, yeah. I can understand why uh, the data lake is very appealing to, to company. And I'm curious about how in the wild people actually make use of it. I mean, <laughs> like in your diagram, there's, there's the AI bolt-on and there's a dashboard. But what do people tend to actually do with their data lakes? A lot of reporting. Um, generally, from what I found, companies will have uh, segregated data silos and part of their technical revolution, whatever, is to move to a data lake and start to bring all of that data into one place. Um, I think that has some very real benefits in that uh, previously, you know, opposite or different teams would have a lot of trouble accessing the data of other teams and there's a complete nightmare of managing, you know, a hundred different database clusters and everyone having their own way. Um, there's very little governance in those. So what I see happening is generally just consolidating all of that into one platform that everyone can use. Um, it does generate a lot of work for them because suddenly data governance becomes a must instead of a could. Um, but largely what I see it used for is dashboards and reporting. Makes sense, thanks. Cool. I think we maybe have time for one more quick question. Yeah. 
Um, what about security? So if you have everyone accessing this data lake, how mm. do you keep secure data from people who shouldn't see it? Sure. Um, personally, we work within AWS, so my answer will be a bit constrained there. But um, as with any other system, you have to secure access in some way. There's good ways and bad ways of doing that. Um, when it comes to things like databases themselves, you can generate, you know, you have to generate credentials for people to log in and use, and however you manage that is your thing. Um, for the unstructured stores or S3 buckets and things like that, we always recommend that SSO is used to authenticate, and that way you can control that only people in your, you know, Active Directory domain are able to access that data. But it is a very broad question in that every company is going to handle that a slightly different way. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Aidan. Cool. Um, thank you. Yes.